So you're turning 70, you've been married for 46 years, you have six children, yeah. your husband Bill asks for a divorce, yeah. and after that is when you learn to love yourself? What I found out was that I had to learn to love myself first. If I was really going to find somebody who could love me, and then I went through that whole divorce process and so on, but I had to reclaim who I was, and so when I was, well, here's another story. Yeah, I, I love your stories, Gladys. I have to tell you. <laughs> so Bill asked for a divorce, and I'm driving my car from our office in, in Scottsdale to an empty house in Casa Grande. The only thing in that house is my dog. So I'm d driving it, and I'm in my car, and I'm letting the world know how, how I feel. And I was broken. I was screaming, I was yelling, I was, st I mean, it was a mess. I was a mess. And it was a long drive to Casa Grande, but I was going on the way, and all of a sudden, I pulled over to the side of the road, and I stopped the car, and I said to myself, are you going to spend the rest of your life like this? This is ugly. This isn't what you want to do. So came to my mind the verse, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be, rejoice and be glad in it. And that be glad hit me. You know, that's your name. Oh, okay. So I then went home and I change my license plate to be glad. So that the whole time I was driving in, in the Phoenix community, I was, um, people behind me had to see be glad. Because every time I got into the car, I had to see be glad. So that was going around all the time I was driving. But then it's, you know, it's, the, the whole process of passing it on to the next person. If I can be glad, I can help somebody else be glad. And it's that, that, that living life process that is love. Bill and I had built the American Holistic Medical Association. I loved him, I loved me. We loved each other and we were doing this whole thing. We had a, a, a symposium for 20 years and when we started the symposium actually I didn't speak from the podium it wasn't until people began saying why don't you speak and then Bill asked me to come up and speak but it's the it's the process of growing into something that was really important and that was my voice that's such a beautiful story and in those moments of he's left you, you're you know, turning 70, a lot of people would give up on love. A lot of people wouldn't then love themselves more. A lot of people would unfortunately love themselves less. What did you do in your mind? Obviously you did the screaming in the car and you changed the Gladys thing, but then how did you begin to love yourself again and still appreciate love? Because Gladys, a lot of my audience and people I know have had heartbreak and they never love again. I know. Well, I wrote Bill a letter and I said, thank you for giving me my freedom because it was when I was no longer Bill and Gladys, I was now Gladys. But all through those years, I was Bill and Gladys. And I accepted that because that's the way it was. But um, when he asked for the divorce, nah, -uh. he was gone. And so I was Gladys and I could claim my voice now. Well, I'm going to ask you at the end of this, Gladys, what your biggest regret is, but I'd love to go through a few more, if that's okay, of yeah. other regrets that other people have. But I want you to hold on to it because at the end, I'm going to ask you your biggest regret. Um, okay, so another regret people say is, I wish I had forgiven more. And so going back to your relationship with Bill, 
Um, you explained how you let go, but talk to me about the power of forgiveness and what the, the potential downside is if people don't forgive. Well, if you don't forget, you get stuck with it and you keep hanging on to that pain. That's what I had to realize. You know, that uh, my license pl plate told me I had to either get stuck with this horrible feeling that I was going through of being rejected and, and you know, that someone else is much more of what I, whatever, whatever, and, and build on that and, and that hurt, and I was hurting, I was really hurting. But when I heard that voice in my head, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I thought, well, I have a choice. I have a choice to be glad about my life still going on, or I can be miserable, which is what I am right now with all this stuff I'm yelling and screaming, and, and I don't want that. So basically, I threw it out the window, and I picked up the be glad. It's a, it's a matter of choices. So what do you do now if something happens? Like, to talk me through the wiring of your brain, of what you do. So if someone's listening at home and they find something is upsetting, hurtful, or they find themselves going into the victim mentality, what do you do in your brain or tell yourself in order to get out of that so that you can get to the point where you're just hysterically laughing? Well, I look at the situation and how ugly it is. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm looking over my shoulder at this mess. Am I going to keep looking at that all the time? That's a mess. I don't want it. I'm going to get a stiff neck if I keep looking at that. So I turn my neck around and I look at the light. We have a choice. And the choice is to either look into the darkness and the pain and the suffering and suffer along with ourselves. And it's very easy to get into that place. It's really hard to look at that place and say, well, yeah, okay, this is really hard, but I don't need to be stuck there. And then pull ourselves back and look for the light. If we're not looking for the light, we'll never see it. That's such a powerful way to think. It is. And that advice will literally help people now not regret, not forgiving in, the, you know, in their lives. Well, and you know, right now, I have a blind spot in my right eye, and I have glaucoma in my left eye, and I can just see your outline. Mm. My eyesight has diminished but my insight has improved. What's the biggest regret that you feel like you have in life in your 103 years? Oh, I don't spend much time on it. Oh my God, that's amazing. That's the best answer. There, there, there are a bunch of little things, you know, that I can, you know, there's some people that I um, really aren't friendly with. They're not, but they're not, you know, uh, I could be more friendly with them. But, you know, they don't like the things I like, so, you know, well, they're, they're, they have their space. Mm. And um, so I let that be, but it's a matter of uh, where I choose to spend my energy because the people that don't want to hear what I'm talking about or what I'm saying, they don't need to hear it. Mm. I mean, they can listen to whatever they want to listen to. And that's fine, but um, if, if I have an idea and I'm going to make them understand, it never works with any of my kids. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think the same thing if it was somebody, let's say, toxic in your life or somebody that doesn't make you feel good, would you do the same, just like not pay them attention, not let that energy into your life? I, I would uh, find out how I could deal with it, mm. you know. Sometimes that, that person is a part of your life, but you don't have to make them 
a central part of your life, or sometimes they are a neighbor that just lives next door, and uh, you know they're there. Yeah. But you can either uh, take what's there and and deal with it and uh, work with it the best you can, or just be aware that they're there. How do you not let that though get inside of you? Because a lot of people, when you're around someone toxic, it can really seep into your core. If you open up to it, it will. It, it really can. And But if you allow that to be their problem, not yours, then uh, if there is such a thing as karma, that's their karma. And they'll deal with it. You don't need to carry that load with them unless you want to. If you want to, go ahead. All right, Gladys, you're 103 years old. If you had a time machine and you can go back and talk to your 20-year-old self, what would you tell her? Do what you did. Just do what you did. Because at the time, it was the right thing to do. Now, I may look back and think, I wish I had change that but at that time it wasn't the right thing to change because it didn't work you know I changed what I could change so it, you know it's that kind of uh, looking for things that affirm what it is that you're looking for or just being aware that you know you don't have to be the same as everybody else you know, you have a job. You have a job to do. You wouldn't be doing the thing that you're doing now if you had stood on your own and let your wings fly. That's true. It's a matter of because you reached out to other people and realized that they needed your help, and that's what I did. If you want to learn the life lessons that women unfortunately learn too late, then click here right now. At the age of 103 years young, Gladys, you say you didn't find your voice until you were 93 years old.